Hello and welcome to another exciting lesson, um, pretty exciting stuff today. Enough with the daytime scenario, I think we covered quite extensively. Um, today we are approaching a sunset or dust scenario for the very first time. I uh, will change the mood a little bit. The sunset is often called the golden hour and this scenario evokes a very strong emotional response and often plays on our memories. We all have some kind of memories with uh, sunrise or sunset, right? We woke up early or stayed up late just to see the majestic view in the sky and the sun disappearing over the horizon. In a sunset scenario, the architecture can be noticeable and readable, but slightly less important. Suddenly, the surroundings, the color of the sky, the cloud formations and the overall colors become more important. Now, it might seem uh, that by referring to this universal and pleasant memories, we'll be able to create an attractive image at a low cost. But as it turns out, this scenario can be difficult or at least problematic in some situations. Nevertheless, it has great potential, both artistically and commercially. That's why today we'll tell you about all the challenges that await us in this scenario and there will be a few of them, both in terms of composition and color. So as usual, we'll start with the theory first, and then move on to the practice. Ok, let's start easy, and discuss the differences between sunset and sunrise, and let's ask ourselves how to emphasize or tell if any image takes place at sunset or sunrise. What makes it look more sunsety than sunrisey, you know? If you consider the sun's journey through the sky, basically there's no difference. There's no difference whether it travels one way or the other. It makes no difference at all, actually. The sun and sky look pretty much the same. But what should we focus on is not necessarily the sky, but everything else. Let's look for differences all around and what's happening during this time frame. See, dawn comes after the night, and dusk comes after the day. This should already give us an idea of the atmospheric conditions that may appear. After the night, especially over a body of water, we'll see a large accumulation of moisture. The entire atmosphere will be filled with this moisture. We can see it uh, on the materials too. There's dew on the grass, leaves, stones, and you know, they have a little bit more of a shine. We will also have more low-hanging clouds. Water vapor may accumulate, especially if there's a high season. If we were to take a photo in the mountains and look down from the top, we would see clouds covering the valleys fairly densely. This indicates that this is the sunrise and is unlikely to occur during sunset. On the other hand, during sunset, if we have, for example, dry terrain, especially in hot season, a lot of dust will be visible on the horizon. The light will be more diffused, the sky will be more intense and effective, and the reds will be more pronounced. So, if we want to emphasize the sunrise or the sunset in our renderings, we can ask ourselves, what are the weather conditions? Is the scene set in the forest, a city, or in the mountains? We can do some research, uh, strategically uh, approach this decision, and add value to our work. It may not be obvious, but for the viewer, it can be this extra touch that will charm him or her somehow and make buy it even more. Okay, so we've mentioned that this scenario can be problematic. Both sunrise and sunset to the same extent. We can face smaller or bigger problems. In fact, it's often easier to sell blue hour than a golden hour. We have, um, you know, uh, a bit more control there uh, when the sun is almost down, but we'll talk about it later. There are at least several problems in the sunset, both in terms of composition and color. And starting with the obvious ones, we can say right away that because the sun is low above the horizon, it will be difficult to control the shadows. We can notice it in this turntable. 
nasty shadows can even rule out this scenario. We can have shadows cast on the facade like so. This is something we want to avoid. Here we have shadows from the foreground tree. It's absolutely hilarious and we definitely want to avoid it. In general, shadows might be difficult to control as well as the sun. Quite difficult for the light to reach our hero, especially in the urban conditions. Even if we move some buildings and cheat a bit, it might be impossible for us to illuminate our building with the sunlight. Even low objects will generate a large shadow, so if the client says he wants a visualization in this scenery, we often have to think really hard about whether it makes sense at all, whether the sun will even get through, or will the whole scene just hide in the shadow. The direction of the low-hanging sun's disk also causes quite a few, often uncontrolled highlights. This doesn't necessarily jeopardize this scenario, especially if the highlights are far away from our hero. We can see that those highlights landed here on the building, so it's okay, it's cool. Here, however, they are wandering up the stairs somewhere, and suddenly that arbitrary element becomes the most important part of the composition, so we have to be very careful about it. We should pay extra attention to highly reflective materials such as metals and glass. Bright light may appear somewhere here, bouncing back completely accidentally, simply because it is at the same height as the camera. We can see here that such highlights can burn right through and cause an unnatural sharp edges where anti-aliasing doesn't work that well. This can be problematic because usually we don't want to emphasize any poles or barriers and we don't want them to draw any attention. In our scene, it's relatively simple, but in an urban situation, it can turn into a gigantic mess. We can of course salvage this situation, but might have to cheat, change materials, render several images with different sun positions, or exclude some objects from illumination. Generally, you might need to do some extra manual work to get it all under control, but let's not get too much ahead of us. Another aspect that can shelve this scenario is the topic of the visualization itself, and to be more precise, how complicated the materials are. If we are working on houses covered with white plaster, the situation is fine. Neutral colors will work well with the warm sun, but if we have some intense colors or metals, this scenario can look a bit strange. It can completely change the look of those materials and it may simply not sit well in the overall color composition. Let's say we have a building with a facade in a strong green color. As soon as we lower the sun down, the illuminated part of the facade will turn yellowish and the other one in the shade will shift into a somewhat bluish color. This is of course natural, but in this setup, the visualization doesn't present the base green color well, and it may simply not meet the architect's vision. And what's more, it may not match the rest of the image either. It's just difficult to put all this together in terms of colors. We can see in the examples here, Dielectrics, metals in strong, decisive, basic colors practically scream and stand out in the foreground. You can of course correct it in Photoshop, but it's also worth knowing that you can educate the client about this scenario and the challenges it poses. Then you can decide together whether this scenario is worth exploring. So if we have strong colors, and the client wants them to be shown relatively reliably, which is often the case, it's often important to talk about it before starting this particular scenario, because it will be a problem that we cannot solve in a way that will satisfy both parties. But the next issues are not deal breakers, we still need to manage them somehow, so let's go through a few potential material problems next. So. Each time you change the scenario so drastically, 
it is worth looking into highly reflective or refractive materials. We often modify glass reflectivity and its IOR depending on a scenario. Different glass setups for midday, sunset, blue hour, and so on. We want the glass to be more or less reflective and match the brightness of the lighting scenarios. So don't be discouraged if something looks off. You might just need to revisit the materials and change the IOR value, for example. Next, we have water, where we often set a specific absorption color. It may work in a day scenario, but it can change colors from more saturated to less saturated. And this works in the daytime scenario, but this color of the water may turn out to be completely unattractive in the sunset scenario. We'll cheat with the materials because it is impossible to make one that fits all lighting conditions, especially if you want to do things really well and create visual interest. And the greenery shaders are another special case. We might need to adjust and adapt plant shaders to our scene. Maybe we will need to boost the translucency, maybe we'll have to warm it up a little bit and go for more oranges instead. We'll come back to that later in the practical part of this lesson. For now, let's just say that boosting translucency in this scenario often adds that commercial punch. However, if we overdo it, we can end up with a fairy tale candy-like mood and lose all the commercial vibe. Lastly, when the sun is low, we'll have quite strong micro contrast on some surfaces. You can see it here. If the scene contains material with a relatively large bump, like sand, soil, or something similar, the perception of this material and the noise that comes from it will change the perception of our composition. It draws the attention away from our hero. We are going to have a lot of sharp edges and they can look nasty. We will have to counter this micro noise somehow, because now, we can see how sand changes from a flat, uniform surface into a very noisy one that's difficult to understand visually. And that's basically most of the possible problems. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't go for this scenario. On the contrary, you can figure out a solution to all these problems. You fix the shadows, highlights materials and colors. You just need to know that if something feels wrong, those are the elements you should pay extra attention to. As you can see, in our situation, this scenario turned out quite nicely. We did even two versions of it. Today we will implement the first of them, the one we showed already. Ok, let's take a look at some references first. We have a wide range of renders here, starting with very delicate and natural looking ones, where the colors are not so intense. It's warm, of course, and in some of them, the difference between warm and cold is more tangible. Sometimes, even the shadows are warm. As you can see, the authors took a very different approach. But at the same time, those renders are definitely commercial. They are not so dramatic that we would rule out the commercial aspect of it. In places, the colors look natural enough that we can barely notice it's the sunset mainly by long shadows. We can see the sun is low, and although the colors are warm, the typical contrast of orange and blue is not very strong. And we can see that a lot of those renders successfully sell the quiet, warm evening feeling without getting too dramatic. And this is definitely worth considering for commercial work. We can sell those emotions elegantly. And on the other hand, we can go into definitely more dramatic tones, whether by setting the camera up against the sun or by modifying the colors in some way. And these sunset scenarios will definitely give us more freedom in our approach to colors. The range of commercially acceptable natural sky colors is rather narrow in daytime shots, while in sunset scenarios, as we can see in this example, we can go basically through blues, through almost white, and even to some strange magenta grayish colors. This is quite acceptable, even commercially. So we can go a bit crazier here. So 
as you can see, the range is very wide and there are a couple of different approaches to this. Some are more commercial, others less so. And our approach to greenery also gives us a little more freedom. In some cases, those micro contrasts and translucency are actually gigantic. In others, very subtle. And yet, everything seems to look good. Besides the fact that the sun dictates a certain behavior, we can also change the materials and affect them, which we'll do as well. So, you can see in these examples that the approach may be very different. So I hope those examples inspire you to take action. And we move on to the practical part. Let's go into our scene. We can approach the sunset scenario in several different ways. First of all, we can use the same methods that we used before, that is uh, either Corona Sun and Sky or HDRI. Uh, on the first go, we'll return to Corona Sun and Corona Sky. So, exactly as before, we'll put Corona Sun somewhere in the scene. I'll make sure those low poly layers are visible so I can get into interactive right away. And we will add our sky. We will drag it to our materials here. And let's see what our scene looks like. First, I'll restart distal mapping. In this scenario, we'll use filming mapping instead of ACES. Set highlight compression to 1 and lower the exposure, let's say, to minus 2. It should fit nicely. And now let's see what we can work out here with the sun. If I move it further away, it will automatically go down. With the mountain at the far right side, as we have here, it may turn out that we can pull off the illumination from a few very limited directions. We can try to illuminate this facade but if we go too far, this forest will block the sun again. We could catch some sunlight from this angle, but if we go any bit further, we'll fall into the shadow of the mountains we haven't seen somewhere here. We can see the mountains reflected here in the glass and they'll collide with the sun rays. If we were to build a scenario with more or less the direction of the sun and solar is visible, it may turn out that we have to rise the sun significantly to have any reasonable illumination. Maybe we'll turn it like this so it shines a bit on the facade. We'll try to go as low as possible without mountains casting a shadow on our scene. This is too low. We are in the shadows again, so it will look something like this. Let's look at it now. And of course we can see right away that we have a problem with the background. That's because we didn't turn on the volume effect in our environment. Obviously, if we turn it on, we can see a dramatic difference straight away. The volume effect will simply look amazing here, especially with the sun shining from the back. So it will make our job a lot easier. It became much more attractive just like that. Previously, we used this altitude parameter to control the color of the sky. We are going as high up as 2000 meters. 
but we'd rather not do it in the sunset scenario because we are gonna lose the color of the sky. So we should stay at the default number and zero seems to be a reasonable value for this kind of scenarios and we shouldn't change it. What's more, we have the turbidity parameter here and we didn't touch it before, but now it can be useful. When we talked about the differences between sunrise and sunset, we mentioned that during sunset there may be a lot of dust pollution or smog in the atmosphere, making the color of the sky more diffused. And by increasing this parameter, we can introduce more light scattering. And we create quite an attractive color spilling. On the other hand, we also lose the intensity of the sun. We can see that it became very soft. Maybe in this case we should raise the sun just a bit. And now we have a problem with the sun being so faint. And that may not be a real problem, because the setting sun is in fact illuminating relatively poorly. That's very natural. However, in the sunset scenarios we often look for this greater than life feeling. As if this golden hour would just explode all over the scene. The greenery is so juicy and colors are intensive. But if we stick to the rule that the lower sun means lower intensity, we lose that effect completely. To fix it, we would have to, for example, increase the intensity of the sun. Seems risky since it made the scene unreadable when the sun was higher, but surprisingly, in this scenario, it gives us a pretty nice warm glow over the scene. We can also enter a particular temperature of the sun, for example, uh, 2500. And this overridden temperature is different from realistic setting because it will always shine with the same intensity, regardless of the height of the sun. If I bring it up, the intensity of the sun will be very similar, only the sky will change a bit here. We also have a lot of this smoky air now around those mountains because of the turbidity parameter, so it looks a bit different than it was during the day. If we pull it down to two and a half, we should get something similar to those relations we had. But that's just a comparison, because we obviously don't want to go up with the sun. We want to stay somewhere around here. And now we can easily control this illumination with the sun. We can raise it up a little or lower it down, and it won't affect the intensity of the light and its color. So now we can build composition as we see fit. And there may be a slight problem with this composition, but maybe before we get down to it, let's talk a little more about the background. Because we set the volume effect on the mountains in the context of the whole sky color. But the sky color is completely uniform in the high ranges, while we would rather see some more action here. Just to make it a little more interesting. Maybe some blue could appear. Now it's also monochromatic, which may be okay, but it's not always what we are looking for. And just like we recently learned to use the override sliders in HDRI, we can also use them to override Corona Sky. So let's turn on Direct Override and copy Corona Sky. Now we can decide that we would like the directly visible aspect of turbidity to be less intense, so that the blue would appear somewhere here. and we can instantly see it in direct. And at the same time, it doesn't affect the illumination. It doesn't affect the volume effect. We still have a coloration from turbidity, because what happens here results directly from what you have attached here to the illumination. If we want this color to be more pronounced, we can lower the intensity a little bit more. 
but let's just not overdo it. It's perfectly okay for blue to come out, but we don't want it to be too intense. Okay, so we have the midground set, we have the background set, and we move on to the foreground, and this is where a certain compositional problem begins. We have lots and lots of light coming into our foreground, and we have to cut it off. So, as we did the last time, we'll try the simplest solution, this is inserting a box. Well, it turns out that the box is already here, because I was too hasty. But the fact is that it doesn't change much here. If we turn this box off, we won't see much of a difference. With or without it, our foreground is flooded with light. So last time we used a tree, and I'm gonna copy the same one now. We try to put it somewhere here, to organically cast a shadow into our foreground, from the side. Maybe I will scale it down a little. Let's see where it ends up here. We can see it touches the ground, but we don't have the shadow yet. So we have to start looking for it, trying to put this tree in the way of sun rays. The problem is the sun is almost completely in the back of the scene. And now we can see the tree. We are just starting to see the shadow here, but now the tree takes up almost half of the scene. Fortunately, we can solve it with the object property and changing visible to camera option. Now the tree has disappeared and the shadow is still there. But if this tree grows somewhere here, the shadow is just too sharp and it doesn't look good in any way. Even if this tree was further away, this shadow problem would remain. We could push it all the way here to this drop-off and say it cast the shadow from somewhere, I don't know, somewhere beyond. But it kind of seems like such a forceful solution. And it can work here but fail to do so in the next 10 scenes you encounter. So that's not the answer we are looking for here, but we rather need to get creative. So, uh, maybe let's put this tree where it was, and just flip it. That's right, let's take this tree and turn it upside down, 180 degrees. I know it might seem crazy, but it totally makes sense. This way we can introduce a natural tree shadow in the foreground, without having the tree touching the ground at all. The shadow will appear many meters from the actual tree and it will seem natural. We don't know where this shadow is coming from, but it doesn't raise any suspicions. It doesn't feel out of place or strange. If we turn this tree upside down and place it a few meters above ground level, we create the impression that the shadow might be coming from the branches right behind the camera's field of view. The shadow won't be any problem, even if the sun is shining on our scene from the very back, and this will make it so much easier to handle. Now, the only thing we need to do is adjust the tree. We want to leave the light in areas we need to have it, and block the sun in areas we want to hide in a shadow. I will maybe try to align my view with the direction of the sun. Well, there are ways to do it much more precisely and we'll talk about them soon. For now, I will just eyeball it.
I will center the tree's pivot and we can copy this object. It's probably a bit too huge for our needs, but that's what I had on hand. We can then move it over here, cover this tree in the foreground. Maybe I will reveal the tree a bit, because the light on this edge was, let's say, cool after all. We don't want to get rid of it entirely. Okay, I think that uh, this shading of the foreground should be more or less okay. So we have made mid-ground, background and foreground, all of them one by one. We can say that they are done. And in the theoretical part of the introduction we talked about one more thing, that is the translucency of materials. And that boosted translucency often adds this extra touch to the perception of the sunset. And as we look at it, of course in the interactive we have it on low poly, so these assets are so sparse, some of them incomplete. But even in this view you can see that the translucency on these leaves, for example, could be just a tad bigger, so that this whole picture would have a bit more of a punch. Well, mm, sorry, but I need to make one step back yet and try one more thing. There is one thing that still bothers me, and I really can't let it go. The shadows of the stones here are quite strong, and maybe if I dry it up a bit, it would help in terms of composition. Of course, I will also have to move these trees. It seems to me that with this highlight here, this composition is balanced a bit better and it's more interesting. Okay, let's get back to the business. Translucency. Even looking at the interactive, we can say a little something. Now, changing all the greenery materials in a scene may seem to you like an overwhelming task, but there are fewer of them than you think. These plants often have the same materials. So let's take the scattered trees for example. This material will apply to all larger trees in general. As we can see, we have only one material for the leaves here. This is corona material. And in translucency color, we have a bitmap, and we can always put Corona Color Correct here. And let's say at 0 0.2 to brightness. And you can immediately see that these trees are moving forward a bit. We could also add yellow tint, but in this case I think these colors are yellow enough and that won't be necessary. Now we can move on, for example, to colors of leaves on this foreground tree. These are the tweaks we have here. We have two materials here, that's the second one, and just to be consistent here we can add 0 0.2 to brightness. That is a change from uh, minus 0 0.1 to 0 0.1. We can see that there is more light here straight away. 
We can do the same thing on twig number one material and suddenly the crown of the tree seems to be more alive. And the same goes for the juniper materials. Most of them are hidden now in this low poly option, but we are going to consistently change it by 0.2 for all of these greenery materials. And we can see it uh, is already 0.6, so uh, we go to 0.8 here. And we can do the same thing for moss. It has two separate materials, uh, one for larger and one for smaller moss. We can also do it uh, for this plant here. It probably has a separate material. And we can see two kinds of leaves here, but I think both of them, or well, uh, even three of them, refer to the same translucency. So we can change it here. Basically, that's most of the materials in the scene. There is still grass here, these bamboos, but they won't be that important. Bamboo seems to be completely in the shadow in this composition, so I don't think there's any need to change that. But if something goes wrong, you can always go back and change this material too. For now, I will turn on all these layers here and just hit render. And then we will go to post-production. Okay, so we can start the post-production now and this is how our render turned out. We have just a couple little blunders here. I mean, for example, this light that's pouring in here in sort of chaotic way. And I consider this bright area here as more or less fine. We will add a vignette later so it will lower it a bit. On the other hand, I think that the ratio of this bright background and the light area here is fairly balanced. What I don't like are these small elements here. And we haven't rendered any masks or anything, so it might be a bit of a challenge to fix, but we'll try to somehow brute force it. We will add a new layer and we'll sample one of those lighter greenery colors. Something like that. And we will brush on all these yellowish highlights with a soft brush. We can add a little bit of this too. We will give it a color blending mode and lower the opacity a tad. And it doesn't stand out that much anymore. Now we are going to make a copy of this layer and add a darker color blending here. This will lower down all the colors that are lighter than this color. And I have to admit that it still comes out a bit, but it looks definitely better now. Let's do it again and maybe locally drag some of these brighter fragments down a little bit more. This is a solution you don't want to overdo, because we can easily lose details here, but if we fix these small elements, we should be able to pull this method off. Okay, I will group it so it won't get lost and we can go on. What can we do next? I would try to add curve layer and bring this area up a little. And I will do it with a soft brush, so this building isn't too dark. Uh, 
I want this to go up a little bit. And now it's way better. On the other hand, I would like to lower the sky a little. Maybe these stones too. We've got too much of this super bright area here. I mean, it's not clamped. We had the tone mapping set up, but not much is going on here. If we'd like, we could bring out some of this detail here to emphasize the sky's gradient a little bit more. Of course, it's not that easy just to modify this area and not to touch the rest. It's basically impossible to do it using the curve. What we can do is use the curve, and we have already used that before, but let's refresh that knowledge. So we will lower the sky down as if we had just the sky here. I mean, we only pay attention to it and now we will go into blending options. And we can set a rule that this layer only affects the layer underneath if they are in a given tonal range. If I move it to the right, suddenly the curve stops affecting the darkest areas in our picture. And when we move it one more time, it starts affecting the sky just in this portion. It looks terrible, of course, because it acts like a border between two adjacent pixels. But we can click on this slider while holding the left ALT key and it will break into two. Now this border became softer. We can expand this falloff to a large degree and it will affect only the highest areas in the image. Let's adjust it a bit more. The difference is obvious. If we want to have even more control over it, we can just mask it to these specific areas. For example, if we worry it will lower the building or whatever we want to keep untouched. We can change the brightness of these stones a bit here, but generally the dark areas will be unchanged. We won't lower them with the curve. And we are able to darken these light areas here in a fairly simple global way with a simple mask on a soft brush. In the last lesson, we've learned how to use the color balance option. For example, we have added some cold tones to the shadows and it made the image look better right away. The shadows were washed up originally. There was nothing interesting in them in terms of color. And we didn't have this nice combination of cold and warm. Just watch as simply adding color makes the image pop up even if the levels are the same. However, the problem here might be that this separation between shadows, midtones and highlights is arbitrary. We have no control over the midtones starting point and the highlight starting point. Our wiggle room is just a few percent, it's not much of a control. But today, we will try something different. We will try a gradient map. And the gradient map is a sort of a color follow from one color to another. Let's maybe do it in black and white so it's more intuitive for So in the lowest areas in this original image, we have black. And in the highest ones, there's white in this case. We can sort of control how this gradient looks. We can even introduce some additional elements into it. Lots of these items. And we have full control over it. We will start off by setting up mid-gray everywhere here. And I'm going to change this to an overlay layer. 
We can also add a soft light so it's softer, but we'll add an overlay to make it more visible. Right now there's not much of a difference. If something changes it's just getting a bit brighter and it's because I didn't hit the middle grey perfectly. But it doesn't really matter now. Now let's go back to this color chart and use it for shadows, for example. We can move along the axis up and down to brighten or darken them. And what's more, we can give them some color by moving it to the right. So, for example, I am able to give them a bit of a bluish or a purple tint. I have a lot of a control over its shade and saturation. And the only thing that I have no control over is that I am not able to subtract this saturation from the original picture. I can just add some color to it. So, if the original image is strongly saturated, we can in fact overdo it. I will show you how we can fix it later. For now, let's focus on this. So, we gave some color to the shadows. And we can also add some color to the highlights. Again, we can control if they are uh, to be darker, lighter, and whether they have any color poured in. They are already quite warm, so I don't think they should be any warmer. But you could do it if you'd like. We can even go into a very strong color, absolutely unnatural. But we can also do it very consciously and gently. We immediately have feedback on how it all looks like. And of course we can add as many extra points here as we need. So if we find out that our mid-range should be for instance colder, we can just add a point. And we can modify this color for example. We have a lot of influence over how this picture looks like. There is no limit here except for our own eyes. We can move these points right, left, we can add more of them. Like I said, the only thing we cannot do is subtract the color. If the image is too saturated, we would just need to put a vibrance layer right below this graded map layer and lower this saturation. If I then copy it, so as not to lose it, I would have more freedom to pour this color in while staying in a realistic range. Or a stylized one, if you choose so. But you know that here the saturation is not exaggerated, because we lowered it. For us, however, I think it should be quite okay. We can dial this saturation down a bit, like literally 2%. So maybe it doesn't stand out that much, especially in this greenery on the left. We can see that it's not quite the same as the color balance, but we can lower it a bit and we are slowly landing in similar areas. We can always switch to soft light if it's too much. I wanted to show you the overlay because the feedback here is kind of more intense, more vivid and more apparent. You can always go down with opacity if you want to weaken this effect a bit. Anyway, we are just able to pour in these colors with great precision and that's what is important. And the next thing I want to do is a vignette. This time I'll just use this crude black gradient. I will use soft light blending and lower the opacity to around 20.
we can repeat that to add a little bit more of the effect. The last thing I will do is just use selective color here to influence the blues so they don't shift to cyan as much. You can lower them or rise them but they die off here so suddenly and I don't want to emphasize this border even one inch. You can also remove some of the magenta from these shadows, but I think it's not that unpleasant, so we don't really need this step. Okay, so we can consider this complete. Today we approached our first not midday scenario in this training, and it was quite a ride. It turned out that Corona Sun and Sky works really well as a source of illumination in this case, but we needed to handle other problems with composition and materials behavior. I think we ended up with something fresh and energetic, but still pretty much uh, commercially viable. We also learned a few more tricks regarding 3D, uh, 3D scene building and uh, color control in post-production, and I am sure they will be useful in any kind of scenario that you encounter. The next theoretical lesson will uh, touch the big subject of contrast and then we'll meet again to talk about backplates and the sky replacement. Thanks and see you soon!